Good morning. I'm the one called to welcome you, and in many ways, I feel like you're still welcoming me. My name is Steve Clems. I am a pastor, retired pastor with Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church in Salt Lake City and of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I am, uh, as of last May, a Methodist and a member of First United Methodist Church, so we can just welcome one another back. So thank you for welcoming me, and I welcome you, and especially greet those who are online and worship this day, and pray that um, today's theme, which has to do with baseball and the gospel, that uh, I might welcome you reminding you of what Jesus said in the 14th chapter of John. For those who love me, the Father and I will come and make a home with you. Now, some of you may watch football where you blitz. You'd go into the other person's territory. Some of you may watch, I don't know, horse, horse riding or whatever. Some that comes, you know, that drives from work. But baseball is about home and homecoming. You begin at home plate and you leave home plate, and the whole goal is to return to home plate. So my prayer for my welcome for you this morning is one of homecoming, that indeed Christ, with Christ's own presence and spirit this day, may, may grant us a homecoming in the word proclaimed in the song celebrated in the holy meal shared and the blessing to go out, declaring Christ's homecoming for all people. In Christ's name, welcome.
I invite you into our welcoming prayer. God, our giver, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for those times of leisure, those times of rest, and those times of passion, even within ballparks. But most of all, we give you thanks this day for your presence among us, for your blessing, for your sending, for your keeping, and in through Christ. Amen. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. You're invited to stand singing. I'm Barbara. Today's reading is from John 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. 
So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, <clears throat> heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God spoken to us this day. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The children may come forward now for children's story with Pastor Steve. Ever heard that before? You ever heard that tune? Oh, good. See, it brought a smile to my face. Have you played baseball? Do any of you play baseball? Have you ever hit a ball with a bat? Oh, you know what? Before I speak anymore, do you mind taking a look that way, saying your name and what school you're going to go to? Okay? So, ready, here we go. Can you tell your name? Say, hi out there, my name is, and what school you're going to. Hi out there, my name is Eli. I told you I'm going to go to Christian. All right. Eli? I'm Micah, and I'm going to Morrison Elementary School for sixth grade. Hi, I'm Eli, and I'm going to American Public Wow. Beginning. Get ready. So, have you ever you've hit a ball before? Can you show me how you swing the bat, Eli? Ready? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here comes the overhand or underhand. 
Okay, underhand, here we go. Wow, dude, keeping your eye on the ball. Way to go. Way to go. So, we, and the, we're, we're going to talk a bit about baseball. When you swing the bat, when you're up to the plate, you get three chances. If I swing and miss, it's called. If I'm standing here and the pitch comes right here, right across the plate, but I don't swing the bat, I'll hear the umpire go, strike two, okay? And then I'm thinking, here comes fastball, because I was late on the swing before for fastball. Do you know what he shows me? A breaking pitch, and it goes down here, and my knees kind of lock, and I swing and miss ho horribly. That's called strike three, and you're out. Um, have you ever heard anyone like count to three saying, I'm counting to three, you better... Has any you ever heard that? Before? Can you tell us? Like Julian, when one, two, three, you better get here or... Yeah, one, two, three, never mind. <laughs> one, two, three means you better get here. So you're about to go to school. Do you know what it, by the way, I played a lot of baseball. Do you know what it feels like when you strike out? You're standing here, and I, I just told you, I swung and I missed badly, and I have to walk all the way back there to my teammates. Do you think I walk back one like this? Ah, it's all right, next time I'll get it. You know, do I think, I, or do you think I kind of go? <sighs> Maybe look at the picture, like, you know, just kind of, okay. Which one, which do you think? Second one. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard when you make mistakes and you strike out. Do you think that, not playing baseball, do you think there's ever going to be a time in school when you swing and miss? Like, here comes the quiz. Oh, I didn't know it was a quiz today. I forgot to start. And you, know, you kind of miss. Do you know what I mean? Like a test. Yeah. Pete. Peter, did you hear that story? That was a long scripture reading about Peter, wasn't it? There was a time after Jesus was raised from the dead, he's standing on the Sea of Galilee. Do you know that Peter was a fisherman? Okay. And Peter, he just said, he said to the disciples, after everything had taken place, go, I'm going fishing. And they said, oh, we'll go with you. And they fished at night, and do you know what they caught? Nothing. They struck out. And Jesus goes, and they see Jesus standing there, but they didn't recognize him. They go, Jesus said, hey, you got any fish? No. And Jesus said, can you hear what Jesus said? Throw the net over on the other side of the boat. Do you, what do you think Peter was thinking? I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing. Right side, left side, what does it matter? You know, but they threw it over to the other side. And how many fish came in? Did you hear that? 150, we'll talk about that, 153. Hmm. Now, took some of the fish. Jesus is doing a breakfast. Can you imagine? Do you, any of you eat fish, grilled fish? You know it's, you know the smell, how it's smelling good. Maybe on alder wood, you know, with salmon or something. Smelling really good. And, pe and everyone's happy because they're like, it's the Lord, he's risen. But you know what? Where do you think Peter was? Peter wasn't really happy to see Jesus. Do you know why? Peter loved Jesus, but three times when he was asked, do you know him? Three times Jesus said, I don't know him. That was before Jesus, when he was crucified. Peter says, I don't know him. And Peter's like, oh, three times I didn't see him. And Jesus comes up to him and says, three times you hear him ask. His name was Peter. Do you know that um, Jesus gave him a nickname, which was Rockman, which is Peter. That's what Peter means. But instead, he's calling him by his own name, Simon. And he asks him, do you love me three times? And then we find out that Jesus forgives him. Well, that's kind of connection for today. Mike and I, I know, do you know what the word gusto means? We're going to do this with gusto. Mike and I are going to go through a song, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Scott to help us. Micah and I, because, do you know who the Chicago Cubs are? 
that's a good thing if you don't. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like an addiction, which is another big thing. Where am I going with this? Um, but the Chicago Cubs, in the seventh inning, when the game's almost over, and it's home time, uh, the announcer, many times, was Harry Carey, who started it, would sing, take me out to the ball game. And, I, and to this day, even when, the, when they're going to do it, like it happened on Thursday night, I call Mike over, and here's what we do. OK, so come here. You're not going to do it? Yeah, you are. Come on. I'll lead it. We'd sing this together. And there's a point where I'm going to kind of stop and ask your participation. You ready? Ready? Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanut and cracker chat. I don't care if I ever get back for its root, 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 get ready, for its root, 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 for the cubbies. If they don't win, it's a shame. Now, here's your part, okay? Follow us with gusto. Do you know what that means? Oh, ready? <laughs> for its one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Oh, thank you, Micah. But you know what? When we strike out, so we're going to hear today, when we strike out God's promises, we're loved and beloved, and it takes more than me and Micah just singing this because it's within a whole company of people. Um, so ready to have some fun? Okay, take it away. Take me out to the fall. Get some runs. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. Ready. As Micah would say, and often does, fun fact. You ready? Here's what I learned getting ready for this sermon. Fun fact. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, had a portable pulpit. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Part of it was very practical. Apparently, he was a short man, and his portable pulpit made him look a bit larger, so he could proclaim even better. But the other reason was, was because John Wesley believed that the gospel should be proclaimed in every corner, in every place of God's beloved earth. So he could take a portable pulpit, and he could set it up out in the field. He could set it out in a workplace. And so how very Wesleyan is our pastor, AJ, when she says, okay, this summer, let's take a portable pulpit and see and connect where God is in our summer activities. Well, Pastor AJ had a wedding to officiate this week. Are you available August 14th? And I go, well, yeah. And she said, well, we're doing this series about where God is in summer activities. And the 14th is baseball. To which she said, I think you're the perfect person for the proclamation. 
Indeed, our pastor is not only a pastor, she's a prophet. I love baseball. I breathe baseball. Growing up, we'd get our sandlot together, get the guys together, and, and if we didn't, we would play games. Um, and if we didn't have enough as a child to get everybody together, well, we'd break off and we'd play um, wiffle ball, or we would play, play home run derby, or even cork ball or stick ball. We were always playing the game. And, and within my very neighborhood, three of the guys I played sandlot ball with ended up being drafted into the major leagues. We were good ball players. We always won the championships. And many of us went on to play at different levels. Myself, not only um, did, did we play for Clay High, South Bend Clay High School, South Bend Clay High School, uh, always ranked, often ranked number one. And in fact, one year, a publication, Sporting News, ranked us number five in the whole nation for baseball programs. Uh, Rank number one, and um, we went on to play, and for myself, though I was recruited with Valparaiso University, only played the fall, and gave up my amateur status and played semi-pro baseball for the Elkhart Shamrocks. I love to play ball, and the stories that I can tell you uh, about, about hitting the first home run uh, after our, my, my team won the state championship, the year after I graduated. They built a brand new ballpark. Nobody had hit a home run the whole season. They had an old timers game. Uh, here it is. It was the first ball hit out as a home run after a whole season ever in the park. I, um, I uh, am not a home run hitter, uh, but my mother came to visit in St. Louis. I hit four home runs in one game. One time, hit in all 10 runs in St. Paul, all 10 runs. And um, playing semi-pro, I have to tell you, there was a little bit of uh, um, an ego building when, when kids would ask me for my autograph, you know. Um, but here's what's happening today. First of all, um, first of all, I bring out this old yellow ball or I can bring out yellow newspaper clippings, and I can tell you about what happened in the past, and you can just pull out your cell phone right now, go, <laughs> boring, you know? In fact, in fact, that's a propensity of what baseball players often do. We like to talk about the past, and of pastors, too, and maybe of church members sometimes, too. Bruce Springsteen sang a song about it. Um, met an old friend uh, back in high school. He was a great baseball player. We came in, had a drink, but all he kept talking about was glory days that'll pass you by, glory days in the young girl, twink of a young girl's eye. So here's a, a sermon within a sermon. Uh, baseball can show us that we don't live in the past. We live in the present, okay? That's what our call is. In another way, an inspiring story from the past but has everything to do with the future. It's about Mally Robinson. She uh, was back in the 30s. She's um, a mother. She is black. She is Methodist. And it was a game changer uh, pun intended, when their Methodist church got a new pastor, the Reverend Carl Everett Downs, back in 1938. And the way that he was a game changer is he brought the black social gospel into place, saying, we need to be involved in the here and now. And besides that, he talked about, and Malik picked up on this, how being black was a gift from God, something to celebrate. Mally had a son named Jackie. Jackie, already as a boy, was a great ball player, local sports hero. But in those days, if you were playing good, you played in the old Negro Leagues. In Centenary this morning, somebody said, yeah, I used to watch their games down there, I guess it's Seventh East, 13th, somewhere around there. But Jackie Robinson learned that he was a gift. And he was the first one to integrate Major League 
baseball. And though he was besieged by death threats, suffered insufferable acts of racism by fans, the public, and even other ball players, Jackie Robinson persevered. His mother would not settle for a gospel that was a kind of pie in the sky, just go through what you go through now and God will take care of you in the afterlife. But it was living in the present now. Okay, that was kind of a sermon within a sermon. Um, Aaron was mentioning, so you, some of you may have heard or seen that the Chicago Cubs uh, played baseball in Iowa last Thursday in a set called Field of Dreams. It was a movie set among corn stalks and, and everything else, and only baseball can cut, tug at your heartstrings in this way. But what was important about the game was the announcer said, baseball is a game of humiliation. Baseball is a game of failure. Think about it. You're, okay, I, it's for real. If you don't know about baseball, you're a really good hitter in baseball if you hit 300, if you get three bat hits every 10 at bats. But that means you're failing more times than you're succeeding, okay? And as I mentioned, with the, oh my goodness, what it feels like to walk back to the dugout after a poor at bat striking out. And remember those stories I was telling you about all those things that I did, you know, that I could kind of build myself up, um, hit, hit in 10 runs, you know, in one game in St. Paul. We lost 11 to 10. Um, yeah, I can go on about this ball, but I mean, really. You know, and part of the reason I think coach gave me the ball and stopped the game was I had a horrible senior year. Broke both my big toes, had ten nice which was just awful. And then, um, remember I told you about the autographs, that I would get autographs, you know, in Shamrocks? Here's what I did to get the autographs. <laughs> I wasn't the best player on the team. So kids, during batting practice, before the game, I would huddle, I'd huddle with them and say, in 10 minutes, meet me down there on the third baseline, and I'll give you a baseball, an autographed baseball. <laughs> Cost me a lot of money, but it sure irked my teammates, and I sure had a lot of fun. Nobody really asked for that many autographs without that. So if John Wesley was to plant his pulpit here, this portable pulpit, I think the thing that he would begin to notice is two things. Um, one, he would notice that I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, uh, except for a blimp in history in 2016, they won the, National, the World Series. Um, they hadn't won a World Series since 1908. Their announcer, Jack Brickhouse with WGN, had once quipped, any team can have a bad century. <laughs> so. I think John Wesley would plant his portable pulpit here and say, what's going on here? You know, where's the gospel? Could it be, number one, that numbers, and there's lots of stats in baseball. You notice that. I know those who are probably engineers would say, I noticed it wasn't that, the, that John reports they caught a boatload of fish or about 150 fish, but they caught 153 fish. The way baseball happened, the way numbers happen with baseball and among fisher people, is that it kind of is the way that we find that we build ourselves up. If you're going to fail seven out of ten times, you're going to lift up those times you're doing well. We know that, and Jesus told stories about that. A Pharisee went to pray. I thank you that I'm not like other people. I, here come the numbers, I tithe. I do what's needed to be counted in rather than those who are not counted. And I think it's at this point that we begin to learn how, how that we find the gospel within adversity. I'm a Cubs fan, it's not like I'm going, oh, Jesus had to suffer, so I guess I'll suffer too and keep on being a Cubs fan. No, there, there's something else to that, with a passion and with a gift. There's something else that happens, especially here in First United Methodist Church, where we're beginning to talk about 
What does it mean that, clo- that we open closed doors into a table where everyone belongs? So maybe this is something we begin to learn with baseball, to be belong, and table doors become tables. That's why we have today's gospel that brings up Peter. I think Peter would have been a great ball player. He has passion. He has character. Doesn't take character, by the way, to root for the Houston Astros or the New York Yankees. They're winning teams already, you know? (laughs) Or Seattle, Aaron, for that matter. Uh, (laughs) But but it it does take character and endurance how we find Jesus with us. And if I may, just move that into Peter, who is about the numbers. How many times, how many times should I forgive? Seven? No, 70 times seven, okay? Um, Peter, who was willing to follow Jesus, even though he got a good dunking, you know, when he walked on the water and then he noticed the wind and the rain. And then here it comes that he's sitting there with our resurrected Lord and the question comes, not Peter, but Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, not Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? You know. And he says, yes, you know I love you. He says, tend my sheep. And then the third time, three times, three times, do you love me? Oh, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Three times Peter had struck out. As those of us who know what recovery is about, we know that we're not rescued out, but through. Through our failings, through our fallings, but we do not fall apart. That's the gospel I believe John Wesley would preach this day. That's the gospel that I receive this day in adversity, a new opportunity to follow Christ. Did you catch it in the song? It's not one, two, three strikes, you're out. It's like an exuberance. And it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. That's what we can shout at failure. Ah, One, two, three, how many times? Because Christ forgives. Christ's spirit endures with us. And Jesus now with Peter, with us, says, follow me. Even to the ballpark. Amen. Are there, do you have prayers that you might bring forward? If you have not, um, thank you for uh, writing them down that Mike may bring them forward. If you are online, I, I trust that our prayers, well, I, please, um, please play, place it in the comment section and Sean will alert me for whom we pray. Okay, he leadeth me.
invite prayers. Do we have any, Sean, coming online? We will not pray for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> prayers are asked that we um, offer prayers of joy and thanksgiving for God's goodness. Prayers for Kevin Jacobson in his recovery from infection. A prayer for Aaron that, that he may enjoy rooting for a worthwhile team this season. <laughs> um, I think uh, prayers for our nation. Prayers for peace, especially Ukraine. I um, sometimes need to find prayers that other people have written. And the prayer that I'm going to read and share at the beginning of our prayers for the people is one that I shared with my daughter when she struck out one time in high school. And uh, it was years and years later, she was going through her purse and she said, here it is, she gave me this prayer and this crumpled piece of paper. And it's a petition that I'll now um, offer now. It is a prayer for young people. Oh God, you see your children growing up in an uncertain and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more life than the ways of the world and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them to take failure, not as a measure of their worth, but as an opportunity for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and to keep alive their joy in your good creation through Christ our Lord. Through Christ our Lord, we pray for the gift and heritage of this nation that you would raise up faithful leaders and make of us a diverse people united in peace and justice. We pray for peace in all places in which there is conflict and war, especially in Ukraine. We pray for Aaron, we pray for ourselves that we may all find passion and joy in God's good gifts in the summertime and this season of schooling to come. We pray for Kevin Jacobson and everyone in need of healing, peace, and recovery for him in his recovery from infection. We pray the gift of the Holy Spirit that indeed we may confess, not only in word and speech, but in deed and truth, that God is good. For this and all that you know that we need, we commend to you, Christ our Lord. Amen. So Jesus came into that upper room Easter Sunday evening, and he said, peace be with you. May Christ's peace be with you. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. We are so glad that you are a part of our worshiping community. As we end our service today, if you would like to give in support of the ministries of First United Methodist Church, you can text F-U-M-C-S-L-C to 73256. For the latest information about our upcoming events and programs at the church or any other information, please visit our website at fumcslc.org. And finally, if you would like to participate in communion today, you can visit our communion service on our YouTube channel, which is available for you at any time. Again, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today, and we pray as you go into this week that you may know God's love, God's grace, God's joy in your life, today and always. Amen.